Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. I'm James. This is Aid. We're up to episode 265 and 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, we're getting into a section in Corinthians where Paul is encouraging the church in Corinth to take up an offering for the oppressed and uh, impoverished Christians in the Jerusalem church. And this is where we uh, first are starting to see the expansion of the kingdom in such a way that God's people who don't even know others of God's people miles away, like mm-hmm. across the known world at the time, uh, but they're, they're nonetheless giving offerings to support them. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's the larger church expanding. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure to read through your copy of 2 Corinthians 8 at home and pause it here if you need to. And then here's my personal paraphrase for 2 Corinthians 8. Paul mentions that the Macedonian churches, which is where he's been ministering recently when he's not in Corinth, out of their poverty, they had given money to support the oppressed church in Jerusalem. And he encouraged the Corinthians to do the same. He says this is less a command and more just a test of the sincerity of their faith in the gospel. Do these Corinthians realize how Jesus, in his carnation, became poor to make them eternally rich? Paul reminds the Corinthians how in the previous year they had initiated this desire to help the church in Jerusalem and now he wants them to complete their offering. He says, if you give out of your plenty when they are low, they will at some point in the future give out of their plenty when you are low and thus there will be some sort of equality for God's people. Paul goes on to say that Titus and another ministry companion who's unnamed will help with the administration of the gift, which they want to do faithfully and honestly. And anytime you're handling any money, you want to avoid criticism and um, yeah, uh, skepticism about how you're handling that money. Another brother is also going to come with them. And Paul wants the Corinthians to treat these guys well and demonstrate to them why he thinks so highly of the Corinthian church. All right, at 2 Corinthians 8, any initial reactions to that? Mm. Not so much? Okay. Devotional thought number one then. Uh, God's great exchange in financial terms. This is, this is one of my go-to passages to describe the gospel in the, God's great exchange, the gospel. Uh, God takes our sins upon himself. He places his righteousness upon us in one verse, mm-hmm. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And it's especially helpful when you want it in like economic terms. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he is rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor so that you through his poverty might become eternally Mm -hmm. rich. Um, It's really, it's it's super interesting because God is not just rich in character, which we often think of him that way, but he's, he's fiscally rich because he's the owner, operator, and king of the entire universe. And yet, when he came to earth, he wasn't born in a palace, so he humbles himself to become human. He humbles himself to become a poor human. He humbles himself to die like a poor criminal on the cross. And in the process, he's given up all of his tangible prosperity for the specific reason of sharing it with us. Uh, it, now, that if he's going to share it with us, that assumes that we are by nature poor, uh, own nothing, deserve nothing, but now, because of the gospel, we're going to inherit everything and we will be kings and queens mm-hmm. uh, owning and operating the universe you know, at, at the resurrection. So if it's true that we will be, uh, you know, by God's grace, eternally wealthy, mm-hmm. the question is, why wouldn't we in the meantime right now for the 70 or 80 years that we get on earth, why wouldn't we be very liberal in sharing our wealth with others mm-hmm. if we really believe that we have all the riches of heaven for all eternity, why are we grasping at trying to take care of our needs or being in hoarding our money right now? And actually, so this is the one that a lot of Christians are, this is something I got from Tim Keller years ago, but um, is really eye-opening for a lot of Christians is the litmus test of genuine faith at the end of time, when Jesus comes back, mm-hmm. who are believers, who are not believers? When Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, mm-hmm. it's Matthew 24 and 25. And you know what it is? It's social compassion. Jesus says, okay, I'm going to say to some, mm-hmm. um, when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was in need, when I mm-hmm. needed clothes, when I was in prison, who visited me? And when somebody says, uh, you know, Lord, we didn't see that. We didn't see you like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he goes, I know what you didn't do for the least of those you didn't do for me. And then he will send them away to eternal judgment. Mm-hmm. 
And the thing, the interesting thing in all of that is those people are saying Lord, Lord when they talk to Jesus. In other yeah. words, from a theology standpoint, they're orthodox. They're identifying Jesus as Lord. Secondly, when they say Lord, Lord, it indicates some level of passion. Mm -hmm. So their orthodoxy is right, their theology is right, and they're somewhat passionate about Jesus as Lord. Mm -hmm. But they didn't show compassion to those who were in need, which means they never really embraced the concept of grace. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says that's the litmus test for who's real believers and who aren't at the end of time. It's really, um, I mean, it's been, for me, kind of transformative. What are what would you say are some things that inspire you to give today? Because you, when we I've mentioned this before in our studies, when we first met, you were uh, challenged me on my lack of generosity, mm -hmm. um, and now I think we're probably pretty closer to where closer to one another on this. Mm -hmm. But what are some things that uh, over the years have inspired you to be generous in giving? I think seeing other people's generosity, um, not just to me. But just in general or to other people. Sure. When you see it's possible. when you And it's so beautiful that it's like, yeah, it's probably the way everybody should be operating, including me. Yeah. Yeah. We've, I, I think I've mentioned before, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, and we started a community engagement, uh, we call it our Benevolent Fund. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned mm -hmm. it a couple different times via sermons or whatever. And uh, we had a young man in the congregation who was only like 26 years old and he was just out of school, but he had saved up money for mm -hmm. a car. And he had watched a video that we did at one of our recent like stewardship retreats. And it was of a couple, a, a woman who served as like a barista or a mm -hmm. cashier who had saved up money and she gave away, she had saved up $5,000 for a car, but somebody she knew was almost like homeless and she gave away her $5,000 mm -hmm. uh, that she was going to purchase a car with and um, she just ended up continuing to ride public transportation. The owner of that, that restaurant or whatever found out about it and mm -hmm. ended up just purchasing her a new mm -hmm. car and she was blown away with a much nicer car. Yeah. And that inspired one of our members who was a young guy who recently out of school who was going to, had saved up a bunch of money, I think like $18,000 for a new car mm -hmm. or for a car for himself. Mm -hmm. And he said, I could get a functional car for $8,000. I'll take the 10,000 extra 10,000 and I'll mm -hmm. just donate it to our benevolent yeah. fund because people need it more than I do. And I was like, just, it was, it's just such a beautiful thing. Maybe this is just an indication of how evil my heart actually is. But when we watched that video, so they took this woman to the dealership and she picked out a brand new car and the color she wanted. I no, would. they had told her that beforehand. Or she had said, somebody asked her the questions, if you could have any color car, what uh -huh. would you want? So they, she didn't actually pick it up. They picked it up for her. Okay, but they bought her a brand new car. Yeah. And in yeah. my head, I was like, that's frivolous. Why would why would you need a brand new car? Yes. Yeah. Why can't they just buy her a used it's car? It's not, yeah, it's, it isn't quite Dave Ramsey approved, but Well, yeah. I mean, that's, so that's your initial thought. Like, oh, that was such a beautiful. Yeah. Mine was like, mm, I feel like you could have done it better. Yeah. I think that, so we've had this conversation before in our growth groups. I think that for people who have had a lot of opportunities in life, so whether that's education or job opportunities, it is so difficult to view, to not view it as I've done so much, I've worked so hard yeah. and now you want me to like give away the fruits of all of that sacrifice and Without realizing that, yes, God is the one who ultimately gives you the all the opportunities. The So I was telling, I had a student like training under me the other day. Um, <clears throat> and we were just talking about different, I was telling him some examples of like different things that have happened to me in the last six months. Now that I've been like on my own practicing. And I said, every night I go home and say my prayers and I just thank God that like the situation turned out well because you have to imagine or you have to remember that when something doesn't go well that's when it's your airway that's like a life or death mm -hmm. i mean you have very sm small amount of time i said i'm just thankful that this i continue to learn and that god like let the situation turn out well um because even though i think like i work so hard and i earn what i earn because i have worked and sacrificed and like I had a situation the other day where uh, it was just a patient with sleep apnea 
and once they were sedated they just stopped breathing and because of the position they were in for the procedure i couldn't get to their airway mm -hmm. and very quickly it went from uh you know we need to resolve this to like this is immediate mm -hmm. and i was in the bowels like out of department in the bowels of the hospital and i told one of the nurses i said call an anesthesia emergency and she didn't know it wasn't a nurse it wasn't there were no nurses down there and she didn't know what that was she said like how do i do that and i was like oh my gosh like this is an aid like you're on your own and i mean because I'm a because I was able to tell everyone exactly what to do and they were really great and they did exactly what we needed and we quick got him in like a different position and he was fine once I could get in there and do what I needed to do then he like quickly came his saturation came back up but it got like pretty bad for a minute yeah why are you laughing <laughs> so I'm trying you you've got me in the like mentally I'm in the space yeah, it got pretty bad. Um, and so, yes, I worked so hard. I'm trained so well. I know what I'm doing. But I'm like, that could have easily gone a different way if people hadn't moved quickly. If like, so we moved him over from the OR table to his cart. Like his cart was in the room, which typically it's not. Usually yeah. we put it in the hallway. Like there were just things where I'm like, obviously God is with me and everything I'm doing. And if that man had died, yeah, I mean... Everything you've worked so hard for is yeah. could be at jeopardy. And so, I don't know. I just feel like God every day is uh, like with me, allowing me to do this work yeah. um, sufficiently, effectively. Not that I'm not trained or not, you know, but... Yeah. No, it, this, well, when it's you're true for every human. human beings... Every, I, I think the idea that so every good thing we have comes down from the Father of the Heavenly Lights, to not plagiarize credit from God mm -hmm. and assume that, oh, I was quick enough thinking on my feet to solve this situation, right. but to realize there was a thousand different circumstances that yes. had to happen the way they did for this person to be okay. And I wasn't really in control yes. of, of a, a thousand of those. Okay, this was just on Grey's Anatomy this week. They, oh. went, they were going to get this heart for a kid's heart transplant. There was a huge car accident. Like all these things happened. The heart was bruised and they still put it in and it was great. Mm -hmm. And the one of the surgeons told the mom, he said, just bask in this miracle. Mm -hmm. And the other surgeon got upset and she said, uh, I don't believe in miracles. I believe in hard work, science, and diligence. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. we did that. And I was like, those that those are the two differing... It's fundamentally different worldviews. And one is conducive towards pride and despair. And one is conducive towards humility and gratitude. And, um, you know, I think Christianity certainly pushes you in the one direction. Um, yeah, so, so when I think I don't want to share my money because I work so hard, think what inspires me to then be generous with my money is I'm like, God saved me in so many situations. Yeah. Like not, and I'm in no way saying there was negligence involved. It's just when you're dealing with the human body, yeah. certain and different people, certain people have certain reactions. <laughs> it's, and, every, it's every human. I think every human who's ever been, if you've driven on the road right, and had sure. close calls, it's like, okay, under for every that could have gone a totally different way and it was entirely due to things beyond my control it wasn't because i was just a great driver god spared me from god's yes. angels spared me from something and i feel like day in and day out he is the one who allows me to continue to do this work and therefore allows me to have the income that i have so to bring it kind of full circle then the i think the idea is when you're filled with gratitude when you mm -hmm. see that the good things you have are primarily the hand of god in your life mm -hmm you are more uh, willing to be God's hand in somebody else's life in terms of generosity and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so devotional thought number two then, God's desire for economic equality amongst believers. This might be a little bit controversial, and I think it actually is. I, I mean, I know it is when I say I think it is. Um, but very clearly here, so it's like, I think verse 15, Paul quotes from Exodus 16, 18. Uh, as an illustration of equality, economic equality amongst the Israelites. Um, and the, that account records the Israelites going out each day and gathering manna when they were wandering in the wilderness. And they weren't supposed to gather too much and hoard manna. They wouldn't, weren't allowed to collect more manna than for that day. And if they did, it was guaranteed to spoil and have maggots in it mm -hmm. uh, the following day. 
And so they also were supposed to, whatever they gathered and they shared with one another, were told that everyone had enough. And it's part of God's design that like God didn't just, he didn't just drop a basket of whatever in everybody's tent. Mm -hmm. He had them go out and collect. So it's like, yes, I'm going to give it to you, but I want you to uh, grab onto this or mm -hmm. receive this. Secondly, you're also, he doesn't give everybody the exact same amount. So you have a six foot eight guy who grabs a giant amount of manna and you have a, you know, six year old kid who grabs a little bit of manna. But when they come home and they divide it, everybody has enough. Mm -hmm. And very clearly there's this concept that God wants. It's not, and I think this would be the question. Is there a difference between Paul encouraging sharing of wealth and so some people would some people immediately push back up against that because we live in the 21st century which means we live on the other side of marxism communism mm -hmm. i'd say i say other side but those thoughts are still there today which is the forced redistribution of wealth and people are like nope no one should ever do that because that is godlessness and that is and i'm like well just understand the early christian church it was very communal. Mm -hmm. God's people, the Israelites, were very communal in their um, selling possessions and giving to everyone who was in need. So what is the right balance and what is the difference between like communist redistribution and the communal mm -hmm. living of Christians? Any thoughts on... Well, everyone knows I love Bernie Sanders, so... <laughs> you have mentioned that more times <laughs> than enough. <but> yeah. <laughs> Like, I, I, I mean, I think he, and Warren Buffett did the same thing. Like, he lived on 10% of his income and gave away 90% of his income. And he didn't leave any money to his family. Yeah. Um, Which, it, living on 10% of your income when you're Warren Buffett isn't Well, th yes, hard, and that's the thing, too. And Bernie's got multiple houses and whatever. Yeah. So, um, the idea of it sounds really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it comes to like personally coming out of your pocket, it's just it's just more difficult. I don't know. I used to think as long as I gave my tithe, I was covered. Mm -hmm. And now we have like a now we have a giving goal each year, like above our tithe, which we adjust. And yeah, um, what was your it's name? it's so the difference between if somebody says. Okay, the equality amongst God's people economically. Well, this isn't right. This isn't forced, so it's not. It, the, well, I guess the early Christian church was kind of forced to do it, weren't they? That's why those people died. Uh, no, they they died because they Ananias and Sapphira died because they lied about it. Okay. But the point is that there was just an understanding in the early Christian church that there would be a sharing of wealth. It says mm -hmm. it says very clearly Acts two and Acts four that none of the Christians looked at their possessions as their own, but they mm -hmm. had everything in common. And again, there wasn't a mandatory. You must sell. All. It's just like they were compelled to do it mm -hmm. because number one, they saw people who were in need, and number two, those who had been given stuff. So Barnabas, the first thing we learn about him is he's one of the most encouraged. He's named after encouragement, the mm -hmm. son of encouragement. But the first thing we learn about him is that he sells a plot of land that he has and gives the money to those who are in need. He sets the money at the disciples' feet, mm -hmm. and so I think really the I, I wish. One of the things that, so you say America is one of the most prosperous countries in world history. It's also a country that is as nominally at least Christian mm -hmm. as any in world history. If Americans are known for anything, it should be for their generosity. Is that what American Christians are absolutely known for today? I don't think so. I think it's also hard to trust so money is one thing that does give you some security, even sure. though I know your money can be taken away. And um, it's, it's hard to trust that if I give this up, someone else would help me if I needed. So like for me, we have no children. Mm -hmm. Like part, of, And I see a lot of patients who come from like very poor nursing homes. Yeah. And I'm like, I just have to save enough money that I never have to be put, I can pay for someone to take care of me when I'm old. Sure. Because who's going to do it? And I don't want to end up in a nursing home like that. Yeah. You know, so there's a part of me that really wants to hold on to that security. And I don't even know if that's a lack of trust in God, probably a little bit, but it's almost like a lack of trust in like other people. If I give all my money to the church mm -hmm. and... I am 90, like who in the church is going to come to my house and take care of me? Yeah. And I think that's, I think you have to trust that they will. 
Like God, if you have in the same way that God has provided for you financially, God will come and provide for you relationally. Mm -hmm. And it's the church's job. That's why, you know, I'll tell people in our church, I can't guarantee that you'll be rich, but I will 100% promise you, you will never live on the street. Mm -hmm. You will always have a home. You will always have clothes. You will always have food. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what being a member of a church means. Mm -hmm. Like other people who have that stuff will share their stuff with you if you come to that point. And so if you're elderly, yeah, somebody will, we will visit you. We will help take care of you. We won't let you end up out on the street. We can't, can't guarantee it'll be, you know, the nicest whatever, but you will be taken care of. And I think that's part of what it means. It's, there's a unique social safety net that takes part, that takes place in a church community in a way that I'm not sure there's anything else in society quite like it. You know, where none of us, if all of us realizes we have treasures in heaven, if all of us thinks that every good thing we have comes from God, and if all of us believes that we aren't supposed to be storehouses, hoarding whatever, but we're, um, I think, I think I remember the way I remember Pastor Jeske saying it once was distribution centers for um, blessings as opposed to storehouses for mm -hmm. wealth. And like, if we just all look at it that way, it's just super interesting. If you crunch the numbers and at some point, I've never seen a graphic like this, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to put it together myself eventually. But if you had, uh, let's say like a hundred people in a church and they all tithed mm -hmm. and you put them in different income brackets, mm -hmm. the people who are at the like quote unquote top probably wouldn't notice even though they're tithing, mm -hmm. you know, like if they gave away whatever it was, ten, twenty thousand $20,000 or something like that, mm -hmm. they probably wouldn't even notice like their lifestyle doesn't change. It's less than taxes. It's yeah. It's, it's like, okay, this doesn't affect life really much at all. So you could give certainly more, but let's just say that they did that. But some people would say, well, you get to the bottom of the bottom income and you'd say like, well, okay, well they shouldn't be giving anything because they're, they're they have so little life standard. They have so little. And I'm like, no, they should. Mm -hmm. They should give whatever their 10% or whatever too, in part because I want them to express faith. Mm -hmm. If you if you deny them the ability to give an offering, you deny them the ability to tangibly express faith. Number two, if you take all the money that the entire group, like if the whole group of let's say 100 people is, let's say tithing, mm -hmm. and you take the money and those who have given a lot because they don't even have needs and they don't even miss it, and all of the, if that trickles down to the people who have greater needs, okay, they gave away 10% of their income, but they're going to get in, re mm -hmm. in return something like the, the math of it works out. They'll get something like 50 to a hundred times in return. Mm -hmm. And so here they are giving what feels like they don't even have, but they're going to get something that is, mm -hmm. uh, like an overwhelming blessing. The math of it works, like it 100% works. And so that there's some level of equality where everybody's needs are met, but we're just all so scared. Yeah. We're so, we just don't have enough faith to trust God, that God is going to work through other flawed humans mm -hmm. to make sure all of our needs are met. And so, I mean, the way you manage your money absolutely says a ton about what you believe in God and what you believe is valuable in this world mm -hmm. what you believe you're going to get in eternity and and who's in control right now uh let's go devotional thought number three and managing gifts responsibly we've already uh kind of trickled over to this a bit but again just how, how christians manage their money says a lot about their faith in general if you're stingy if you're stingy it means you don't really believe in grace very much mm -hmm. right because you think that everything that you have is what you deserve because you worked hard for it and you're in control and you have to take care of yourself and yeah. you just don't really believe in grace. Um, similarly, the way we handle things like donations uh, also indicates whether or not we're honest, responsible, trustworthy people. It really is interesting how careful Paul is when he collects an offering from the Corinthian church. He's like, I want at least three or four people managing this gift mm -hmm. and very transparently because I don't want there to be any... Uh, accusations of me like skimming some off the top mm -hmm. or anything like this. I want people in any, he chooses people, not only his own people, but somebody from Corinth, somebody from Jerusalem. Like they're all here on this. They all count it up together. They're all transporting it together. Mm -hmm. So that there's no, they don't, there's just so nonprofits in general still today are supposed to be as open with their finances and as every, mm -hmm. as anybody. Um, what that means for things like churches today, I, you know, I'm sure there is a level of what uh, you 
what you share about donors mm -hmm. and how much funding comes out of that. Like there is a level of like appropriateness. Um, if every organization says like, here's exactly what this person gets paid and that's just like posted on mm -hmm. their website, that's probably too much. Um, nonetheless, people should know where their dollars in general are going. Mm -hmm. They should know what types of ministries it's supporting, um, that kind of stuff. So I, I remember, well, I won't, I won't get into it. I remember hearing a church leader at one point in the past say your, your offerings, those are just between you and God. And he said it a couple times. And at one point I was like, meaning no one at the church will look at, no one should know. And no one, no one does know. No one should know. And I said, okay, number one, can you show me in the Bible where it says that? Mm -hmm. Like your offering is just between you and God. Like never in the history of God's people historically has that yeah. been the case. They, everybody saw, everybody mm -hmm. knew. Um, secondly, it's not even true at our own church. Like we give out offering statements at the end of the year, like very clearly, it's not yeah. just between you and God. We have an accountant that, that knows it. Thirdly, I think when you make it, when you emphasize the privacy of it, um, it, it avoids, it, it doesn't allow for the, um, what we talked about earlier, which was the blessing of seeing somebody else be generous on mm -hmm. occasion. Like I've told that story about a couple different young guys giving 10,000 in one case, 20,000 mm -hmm. in another case who they don't, they're not rich. Yeah. They were just compelled by a need and they gave it. And other people saw that and they didn't feel guilty. They just felt like inspired. Right. And if you just privatize every expression of faith financially, like other people don't get as inspired by that, mm -hmm. right? So I think there is a level of uh, discretion, but there's also a level of maybe don't be quite as privatized as, as what we might be inclined in privatized American culture to be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, but this whole issue and this point of being very careful and responsibly, faithfully managing the gifts that you're given is, I think, a good one for every church and every nonprofit, mm -hmm. every organization. Is there ever, I'm curious, is there ever an organization that you, you thought about giving to but didn't because you weren't confident about the management of the gift? There's organizations that I no longer use like have stopped using because I didn't think everything was as um completely uh, above board or whatever um or just like as it's an I don't know if it's even it must be for profit right um uh no it's yeah. not no I I know what you're talking about it's, it's profit or not profit none it's non profit okay Correct. so i someone explained to me who used to work at this organization like exactly how they build for certain things and i was like that this is an organization that just claims to be really generous and yet um i feel like they're like double charging so anyway yes that's not really a question i guess <laughs> um, it's, but but the point is it's i think it's doubly so you expect uh a large secular corporation to at times have hidden fees yeah. and stuff. It's a little bit more disappointing when it's like a religious organization. When it's a religious organization. And I understand it's still a business, but I, so I, I remember somebody once, I, not just once, this has happened a couple different times where, uh, somebody tried to make an offering and mm -hmm. maybe did it online. Um, and something happened where either the wrong amount was applied mm -hmm. or it happened, it went through twice or something like that. And, um, people got really upset and I had to like deescalate and talk to them and say like, okay, this wasn't a malicious, I promise mm -hmm. you, no one's it trying to. It happened to us, right? Yeah, it's happened to us. I, I, honestly, it's probably happened in every, every church, every organization. Uh -huh. And like trying to, to say like, okay, nobody was maliciously trying to do something here. It yeah. was an honest mistake. We will do our best to correct it. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it's like, okay, if we assume that as a center saved by grace, people make mistakes, mm -hmm. we're going to forgive. There's other times where people have just been so upset about it mm -hmm. that they've left. I literally left the church. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I don't know what to do at that point, I, but we should show grace in the way that others are trying to manage money too. I do like at St. Marcus that when you give, you can designate a portion. So like some of my, uh, not tithe, but some of my additional offering goes specifically to the benevolent fund, sure, which is then used to help people in the community. So yeah. I, I kind of like that you can do that or give a special gift on the website. You can give a special gift like for something. If yeah. you're like, oh, I don't really like those plants, I'm going to give a special gift to pay for a new plants. Well. 
<laughs> we just got new plants and they're very nice actually, but um, they are, yeah. No, it, it's the idea of being able to give to special. But and I didn't your, pay for that. Your point, your point of that people would know in general where dollars go. They don't yeah. need to know every dollar and cents. There's somebody who does that for a living that figures uh-huh. that out. And you should. You, there's a level of trust that you should have. In the same way, I think it's like in a marriage. Uh-huh. Um, there's a level of you do need to trust the person uh-huh. that like okay, they, they can leave the house sometimes without you by their side and you still believe that they're going to be mm-hmm. honest, faithful, all that sure. kind of stuff. But there's also an important level of transparency yeah. that like you can check each other's phones or whatever. The other organizations that I have given to in the past, um, Fight for a Cure or whatever, the Chris... Tomlin. Yeah. The Chris Tom, one Chris Tomlin supports where they fix cleft palates and... Africa, um, and the other, oh, and Answers in Genesis. I've never given to those organizations and thought, ooh, I hope this is used. Correct. Like, I yeah. trust that Chris Tomlin's not skimming something off the surface, you know? Yeah, well, and at the end of the day, I think you also, there's a level of uh, trusting and honoring God with a pure heart. Mm-hmm. So it's good to be, it's good to hold groups accountable. It's good to have transparency. But at the end of the day, if the heart is pure, you know, God accepts you. Well, and also, so like Answers in Genesis, like... I've seen Ken Ham in person. He's not spending a lot of money on like his clothing and overall appearance. <laughs> I don't know how we turned a conversation about generosity into slamming Ken Ham's. No, wardrobe. I'm saying he's not wearing thousand dollar <laughs> sneakers. He's you not. know, and I guarantee I've never. He's not seen wearing fifty dollar sneakers. If I'm you went sure. to his house, you wouldn't be like. Yeah. That's just not his, um, and you can tell that, and because he's the founder and. Leader, maybe not leader, founder and yeah, leader, he's a CEO of, and founder of that organization. Then, because of the way he presents himself to the world, I trust. Yeah. That that money's going to proclaim gospel truth. We're very. If if you haven't figured this out yet, we are big uh, answers and Genesis answers and Genesis fans. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ken Ham, even though he's getting a little older and sometimes prickly on social media. Uh, he, he nonetheless is so is it passionate prickly about prickly, or is it just? I mean, he will well, speak the truth. This is a different. <laughs> this is a different study, and we're at our time. He but, so he um he had he bought rainbow lights for the ark, and yeah. he had like a whole campaign of we're taking back the rainbow, and yeah. he lit the ark up with rainbow. He, and part of me is like, good for him. Yeah, he's so passionate about biblical inspiration and yep. inerrancy and defending it, which is more Christians should be. There are times when he becomes almost antagonistic. He about said it. he came to America to be a missionary. Yeah. He's from Australia and yeah. God told him this is where they need it the most. We're yeah, we're thankful that we've been blessed by his ministry. So all right, let's close the prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, you have been unbelievably generous with us not just giving your son for our lives uh, but sharing all of heaven and uh, really all of the the universe and its blessings with us Uh, you've provided for all our needs daily you've and not just provided for our needs you've given it to us abundantly help us to be increasingly generous people help us to grow in the grace of giving both to support the gospel ministry uh, and also to support those who are in need that are all around us in, in a variety of different ways. And if we don't know anybody yet who's in need, that means we need to probably expand our relational group to find more people who are in need. Um, help us to be generous like you were generous to us, uh, not because we have to, but just out of gratitude for having been so undeservedly blessed. May it glorify your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for studying with us. We'll see you next time for 2 Corinthians chapter 9.